Lanka replies to Duisburg, 2. The latest reaction of Peter Duisburg, 1. To the ascertainment that HIV does not exist, 2. And to the thorough line of argument that all claims about him characteristics ascribed to HIV do not withstand specific scientific examination, 3. Raises questions. Why does he so vehemently defend something for which there are not only no proofs but also no necessity, and which has pushed millions of people into fear of a retroviral plague transmitted through sex and blood? Why do HIV-virologists never subject their viruses to the same generally accepted standard techniques of molecular biology as all other virologists and biologists do? In his latest monograph of 5.11.96, Peter Duisberg introduces a more untenable claim than ever, which neither he nor anybody else can substantiate, to suggest again that there is a genetic entity HLV. He equates cloning, a standard technique of multiplying a given genetic sequence, with virus isolation and the existence of HIV. After the question of the existence of HIV was first posed and people began to rethink HIV and to understand that with the available exact identification techniques of genetics, biochemistry and virology not a single aspect of the existence of HIV has been proved, apparently there was a desire quickly to postulate new criteria for its existence. That this new line of argument is put by Peter Duisberg, known for his critique of the idea of an infectious AIDS yet otherwise one of the godfathers of retrovirology is revealing. But the quicksand beneath Duisberg's construct is visible. When instead of referring to the established criteria of structural identification, he now postulates functional criteria. Cloning, multiplying, is isolation, though the thing to be cloned has never been identified as part of HIV. No structural criteria with which one can exactly identify genuine biological entities are to be used in the case of HIV. No analysis of the form and size of an isolated virus, the kind and composition of its proteins, e.g. if one wants to use the proteins in an approved antibody test, its genetic substance, e.g. if one wants to carry out the test tube, experiments which Duisberg cites, or do viral load measurements. We are encouraged arbitrarily to believe in only the repetition of processes, which, ad hoc, were ascribed to be viral attributes. When he claims there are at least 19 full-length HIV genomes that 19 molecules of the complete genetic substance of HIV exist in this world, though this has not been shown or claimed in a single scientific publication. For the purpose of secure identification of a virus, the right means, the means of structural isolation, have to be applied before one carries out functional examinations with parts of the virus. For a clear understanding of this important argument, the main terms are again briefly explained here. A virus is an acellular form of organism, being no more and no less than a piece of genetic substance, according to a given species of virus, always of the same length, and a covering surrounding the genetic substance, composed mainly of proteins, according to a given species of virus, always of the same form and size. Viruses are stable because they have to leave cells or even the organism in order to infect other cells or organisms anew. Using centrifugation techniques it is no problem to separate viruses from all contaminating components and in doing so to isolate them, then photograph them, then represent their proteins and genetic substance in a direct way. In the case of HLV this has not been done up to today. For HIV as a whole, or therefore for any of its components, its proteins or genetic substance. 2. 3. The scientific conclusion is that the existence of comma comma HIV has so far not been proved. The logical explanation, given that all characteristics ascribed to HIV are well-known cellular entities and characteristics, is that HIV never was and the claim of the existence of HIV is not sustainable. The idea which led to the claim that HIV exists is based on a decisive false assumption. From 1970 on some scientists and much of the public were led to believe that since a certain biochemical function, reverse transcription with its then unfamiliar mode of action, did not fit the dominant world picture of genetics, it would be explained only through the claim of the existence of a new class of viruses, the retroviruses. 
The shock of reverse transcription was that it is possible to make genetic substance out of messenger substance, which until then was believed to be impossible. However, that the detection of reverse transcription is not, as some research directions still assume, a sign of certain depth, e.g. HIV equals AIDS equals death, Gao, Ho and colleagues, or a reference to the most harmless viruses in the world, Duisburg, was proved when it was shown that reverse transcription reflects a repair mechanism of damage in cellular genetic material. In one revealing experiment, the chromosomes of yeast, 5. So comma tragically, in 1970 the detection of a healing process gave birth to the idea of a new class of viruses and eventually HLV, because astonishingly researchers were not willing to rethink their models or listen to what nature has to tell them. The stubbornly held notion that reverse transcription was inevitably retroviral was first employed in the war against cancer as cell multiplying viruses, then as the opposite, in the war against medically induced AIDS as cell-killing viruses. It is of the greatest importance in this context that HIV researchers, when trying to detect the activity of reverse transcription which is always the first step in the attempt to identify retroviral structures and characteristics, instead of using the natural genetic messenger material, the RNA genome of the virus which should be there, if the viruses existed always use, without any explanation why, synthetic messenger material templates. 6. Above all it is known that those templates are not specific for the process of reverse transcription, that they are efficiently recognized and transcribed by the normal, common, cellular genetic material producing enzymes as well. 3. The whole idea of HIV would collapse if it was possible to bring this fact to public attention. It should be clarified. It is very normal that genetic material DNA, natural or artificially multiplied, when put onto cells is able to enter those cells, may integrate itself into the cells, chromosomes and eventually may be activated to produce its proteins. The idea of vaccination with naked DNA to which I strongly object for various reasons, is based on these known mechanisms. To add a DNA clone to cells and later to prove its presence and probable activity is nowadays a standard experiment in lectures on biology, but in no way a proof for the existence of HIV. So one can only guess why molecular biologist Peter Duesberg refers to such a standard experiment as proof of the existence of HLV, as the group around Eleni Eliopoulos et al. has shown, 3. Neither he nor anybody else has shown that the genetic pieces of HIV used in the transfection experiments he cites, 9. were isolated out of a virus. Only if researchers were able to multiply from cells exactly that genetic material which previously had been isolated from a virus, only then the claim of virus detection would be valid. Virus isolation logically always goes first. Or may anybody postulate new viruses sprinkling his or her genetic material onto cells, detecting this material in the cells and claiming a new virus? A repeated artifact remains an artifact. To call such redetected DNA infectious DNA is conspicuously misleading. When Peter Duesberg refers explicitly to a publication in which we read, tested blood cells of 409 antibody positives including 144 AIDS patients and 265 healthy people, LN addition 131 antibody negatives were tested, 